I'm Nikki Strong, and this is VOA One. The hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, our Higher Education Report considers a dispute between the leaders of Canada and India. Then, Ana Mateo and I discuss some thorny topics after this week's words and their stories. And finally, Kelly Jean Kelly tells you about Harry Truman, the American president who followed FDR. Canadian universities are confirming the safety of their Indian students and providing resources after a diplomatic crisis between the two countries. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau publicly accused the Indian government of being involved in the killing of an Indian separatist leader in Canada. India deplores the accusation. As Canadian colleges prepare to open classes, some students are considering delaying their studies. Others are wondering whether higher education could be damaged in the current crisis. India by far supplies the most students to Canada's fast-growing international education business. About 40% of study permit holders are from India. International students provide over $14.6 billion to the Canadian economy each year. Estimates by professionals in India show that over 100,000 students are preparing for an English language test and organizing financing to study in Canada next year. Top universities offer programs costing up to $29,000 a year. They are connecting with students to confirm the diplomatic disagreement does not damage one of Canada's better-known exports. Joseph Wong is vice president of the University of Toronto. He said the university has reached out to many partners in India to confirm they are committed to continuing cooperation. The University of Toronto had more than 2,400 international students from India in 2022-2023. Canadian universities say the diplomatic disagreement may only be temporary. But Ashok Kumar Bhatia, president of the Association of Consultants for Overseas Studies, said many Indian students have become concerned about their safety. John Tibbetts is president of Conestoga College in Ontario. He noted about a 100 students out of the thousands that register every year were asking about delaying their study. Some current students were also seeking to attend classes online. Our biggest concern is the uncertainty. What might the Indian government do as far as visas, and how might people react, Tibbetts said. International education has seen strong growth in recent years, helping the industry become one of Canada's biggest exports. 
York University's president, Rhonda Linton, was in India when news of the dispute broke. She said she is sure the two governments will be able to eventually resolve the situation. But in the Indian state of Punjab, families and hopeful students are worried. An estimated 25% of families in the state have a member studying or preparing to study in Canada. Taxi driver Jiwan Sharma is considering whether his son should complete his recent travel plans to Canada. I have put my lifelong savings worth over 250 million rupees, or $4 million, for sending our son to Canada, hoping he would settle there and help us in old age. Tensions do not seem to be decreasing. After a report that India's government asked Canada to withdraw 41 diplomats, Canadian Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie said Canada wants private talks with India to resolve the diplomatic dispute. Gurbakshis Singh, a student in Punjab, told Reuters he is sad that India's relationship with a welcoming country like Canada has worsened. The government has put our future in jeopardy, the student said. I'm Gina Bennett. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On today's program, let's talk about flowers. But not just any flowers. Roses. Who doesn't love a beautiful, sweet-smelling rose? The ancient Greeks and Romans connected roses with Aphrodite and Venus, the goddess of love. In modern times, you give a red rose to your true love and a yellow one to your true friend. But roses also have a bad side, thorns. A thorn is the very sharp part of some woody plants, like blackberry bushes and roses. A prick from a thorn is painful and can cause you to bleed. So a rose has both beauty and pain. That is where the saying, every rose has its thorns, comes from. It means that rarely is something completely good. Even a very pleasant thing, event, or situation can have a bad or unpleasant side. You also could say, there's no rose without a thorn. Actually, there are some kinds of roses without thorns. But let's not go down that garden path and just stay with our expression for today. Now, here is an example of how to use the expression, every rose has its thorns. Let's say you were on a game show and won a new car and a trip to Mexico. You are very excited but then find out that you must pay taxes on all the winnings. As you get ready to pay the big tax bill, you could say, well, every rose has its thorns. Thorn has another meaning. It can also be something or someone that bothers you. A thorn in your side is a small problem not a serious one. After all, thorns cause pain, but they are not going to kill you. A friend 
who always borrows money from you, could become a thorn in your side. She is annoying, but not a serious problem. But what if her money troubles led to bigger problems for her? Let's say she cannot pay her bills, and she is in danger of losing her home. In that situation, we can say she has made for herself a bed of thorns. This expression describes a painful, difficult, or unpleasant situation. On the other hand, if she finds a way to make a lot of money and she can pay off her debt, we can say she is now sleeping in a bed of roses. That is a really pleasant place to be. Sometimes, though, we use a bed of roses in a negative form to describe an unpleasant situation, like in this example. Hey, how's everything going? A couple months ago, you told me you were struggling to pay your bills. I was totally broke. I had no money at all. That sounds really stressful. It was no bed of roses. I can tell you that. I can't tell you how happy I am to be out of debt. And that's all the time we have for this Words and Their Stories. We hope that your English studies have not become a thorn in your side. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English Podcast. We just heard Ana Mateo talk about flowers. Everyone loves the pretty colors and sweet smell of flowers, but you should be careful with some of them. Ana is here now to tell us about those dangerous flowers. Welcome, Ana. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me. Dangerous is a little strong. <laughs> Dangerous is a little strong. Okay. Remind us all why we are talking about flowers today. Well, Dan, this week we are talking about roses. And many people love to walk through rose gardens and smell the lovely roses. There are many types of them. But be careful. If you touch them, you may get pricked by a thorn. So we are mostly talking about thorns today. So, Anna, this is a really important question for this conversation. Do you remember the 1980s band called Poison? Oh, my gosh. Yes, I do, Dan. I remember Brett Michaels and his big hair, and that's why we call Poison a hair band. You also remember their hit song, Every Rose Has Its Thorn. So what does that saying mean? I was more of a heavy metal girl, uh, Dan, growing up, but I do know that song. And the saying, every rose has its thorn, has to do with this idea. A really pretty thing, such as a rose, can also have something painful, something unpleasant. Are there any other thorny expressions you want to review this week? Well, in my story, I also talk about this expression, to have a thorn in your side. And that reminds me of my favorite basketball team, the Cleveland Cavaliers. They had some really good teams. And Michael Jordan, the famous basketball player for the Chicago Bulls, was the thorn in the side of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Every time they had a big game, he would make the winning shot and disappoint me and all the other Cleveland fans. That's a big thorn. Michael Jordan would be <laughs> considered a very big thorn. Well, thanks, Anna. It's been great having you, as usual, to talk a little bit more about words and their stories. Now, you know, I, I, I want to sing that song, Dan. You know that. Go for it. Every rose has its thorns. And that's exactly how that guy would say it, kind of twangy. So that's not my take on it. That was fun. 
Thank you so much, and thanks for having me on your show. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Harry S. Truman. He became President of the United States in 1945, a few weeks before the end of World War II in Europe. Truman took office after Franklin Roosevelt died suddenly of a cerebral hemorrhage. Roosevelt had been president for 12 years, but Truman was new to the position of vice president. Two other men had earlier served in the office under Roosevelt. On April 12, 1945, less than three months after he became vice president, Truman was called to the White House. There, Roosevelt's wife, Eleanor, told Truman about her husband's death. Truman was quickly sworn in as president. Shortly after the ceremony, the Secretary of War privately told Truman about a secret project involving American scientists. They were building an extremely destructive atomic bomb. Historians debate whether Truman already knew about the project or whether the information was a complete surprise. In either case, the new president had to decide whether to use the weapon, which he called the most terrible bomb in the history of the world. Harry Truman came from simple beginnings. He was born in the state of Missouri. He, his parents, a brother and a sister, lived in the town of Independence. As a boy, Harry Truman helped his father on the family's farm, but he did not enjoy the work. And he could not play sports because he could not see very well. From the time he was a child, Truman wore eyeglasses. So he developed his interests in reading and music. He was an especially good piano player. Truman was also a good student, but his parents did not have enough money to send him to a four-year college. Instead, Truman worked in a number of jobs, including as a bank clerk, mining company operator, and partner in an oil business. When the United States became involved in World War I, Truman decided to rejoin the National Guard. His guard unit became part of the U.S. Army, and Truman earned a position as a captain. Truman experienced real success in the military. He was an able soldier and leader, and he and his troops fought in battle. When the war ended, Truman kept both the feeling of self-confidence and the friendships with the other soldiers he had formed. One of Truman's first acts after the war was to get married. He married a woman from his hometown. They had been romantically linked for a long time. Her name was Elizabeth Wallace, but she was called Bess. The Trumans remained happily married for more than 50 years and had a daughter named Mary Margaret. In the first years after the war, Harry Truman opened a men's clothing shop with a friend from the military. But the shop, called a haberdashery, eventually failed. Truman soon found a new line of work. An operative from the Democratic Party asked Truman to be a candidate for a position as a judge. Truman won the seat, as well as a public reputation for being an honest, effective public servant. In time, Truman successfully won election to a seat in the U.S. Senate. For the most part, he earned a good public image there, too. 
he supported the social programs of President Roosevelt, and he tried to prevent big businesses or large labor unions from misusing public money. Both voters and Democratic officials liked Truman enough to accept him as the party's vice presidential candidate in 1944. Truman performed well as a candidate, but he did not have a close relationship with Roosevelt or play much of a part in his government. Yet in a few weeks following Roosevelt's death, Truman was leading the country. Truman faced a number of difficult decisions during his two terms as president. Many of them involved foreign policy. His actions helped shape the second half of the 20th century. In his first months after taking office, Truman watched the end of World War II in Europe. He then had to decide how to deal with the war in the Pacific. Japan did not want to accept the Allied forces' demand for total surrender, and Truman did not want to extend the war. So he approved using the atomic bomb on Japan. Truman directed the Secretary of War to drop the weapon on military targets and try to reduce civilian deaths. But the destruction was still terrible. An estimated 192,000 people died in the attack or the effects of the bomb in Hiroshima. Most of the city was destroyed. Three days later, the U.S. military dropped another atomic bomb, this time on the city of Nagasaki. More than 70,000 people died instantly. The Emperor of Japan called the weapon a new and most cruel bomb. He agreed to his country's surrender on August 14, 1945. World War II came to an end. Truman and his government quickly had to make other decisions about how to react to the new international situation. One of the most pressing concerns was the Soviet Union, Soviet officials sought to expand their influence around the country's borders, especially in Eastern Europe, Turkey, and Iran. Truman and other U.S. officials believed those moves threatened American interests. The United States supported democracy and capitalism. It did not want the Soviet Union's form of communism to spread. So Truman's government put in place two measures to answer the Soviet Union's influence. One was a policy known as the Truman Doctrine. It promised American support to Greece, Turkey, and other democratic nations against authoritarian forces. The measure was a new step for the United States. In the past, the country had tried to avoid conflicts that did not directly involve it. Under Truman, the U.S. government was committed to helping free peoples anywhere by improving their living conditions. A second measure came to be called the Marshall Plan, after Truman's Secretary of State, George Marshall. Marshall wanted the United States to invest a large amount of money in rebuilding Europe after World War II. Because the Soviet Union controlled much of Eastern Europe, the money eventually went to improving the market economy of Western Europe. The Office of the Historian at the State Department notes that one effect of the Marshall Plan was to introduce foreign aid programs as an official part of U.S. foreign policy. 
Truman also sought to guarantee peace and contain communism in other ways. He supported the United Nations, which was officially launched during his presidency, and he negotiated a military alliance among Western democratic nations. The group became known as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. Military alliances became especially important in 1950, when communist forces in North Korea invaded South Korea. The UN agreed to send troops to help South Korea, although many of the troops were American, and they were led by an American general. Fighting in the Korean War lasted until 1953. As many as five million people died in the conflict. Neither side gained much territory. But the Korean War had other effects. It fueled the Cold War between communist and democratic forces. It showed the U.S. would really defend other countries against authoritarian forces it sharply increased American spending on the defense industry, and it helped make President Truman very unpopular. Many Americans believed Truman was losing the battle against communism. During his presidency, the Soviet Union successfully tested a nuclear weapon, and China officially became a communist country under Mao Zedong. Some U.S. lawmakers even accused Truman's government of protecting communist spies. Senator Joseph McCarthy was the most famous of these critics. He launched investigations against thousands of U.S. government employees, as well as movie actors and directors in Hollywood. McCarthy did not have evidence that these people were secretly working for the Soviet Union, but his campaign helped fuel the public's concern over communism, a fear that came to be called the Red Scare. Truman grew tired of the accusations, as well as other political battles. He decided not to seek re-election in 1952. Instead, he retired with his wife, to their home in Missouri. At first, many Americans had mixed emotions about Truman's presidency. For the most part, they did not support the Korean War and they remained suspicious that his government had included communist supporters. But Truman's public reputation rose over time. He became known as a down-to-earth person who would and could fight if needed. His supporters liked to say, Give him hell, Harry. Truman is also remembered for taking some steps toward ensuring equal rights for all Americans. Truman supported the racial desegregation of the military and banned racial discrimination in the civil service. But Truman is probably best remembered for the difficult decisions he made during his presidency, especially the one to drop atomic bombs on Japan. To the end of his life, he accepted responsibility for the decision and did not apologize for it. Truman died of natural causes at the age of 88. His remains are buried at his presidential library in Independence, Missouri. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's the Learning English Podcast for today. Thank you, Kelly, for that report. And thanks to our VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. Most importantly, thank you for listening. For more, visit our website at learningenglish.voanews.com.
I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel.